The new topic is your documentary requirements. And the last form was sort of a different form. It was, it was actually a different regulating body that was overseeing that form. That was the IDFPR, regulate, uh, the Illinois Department of Regulations and Financial Professional Financial Professional Regulation, or I'm sure I, of professional regulation. I just messed, jumbled up the, the acronym. But the point is, they administer that form. This form is being done by the Illinois Department of Agriculture. And so for all the, the next three forms, that's who's actually administering this program. So they came up with some different forms and some slightly different rules. And in fact, if you spent any time on the 610-page law that actually made cannabis legal as of January 1st, you'll see that there, the section on infusion and the section on trans, transportation and the section on craft grow were like tiny, tiny, tiny. When you see it's tiny, that generally means more is coming because they just didn't have it all worked out at that point. So what they did was they created something called emergency rules. Emergency Rich. rules were, docu were, were, set, were posted on their site. If you go to the invitation from today, you'll see a link. It will take you straight to those emergency rules. The emergency rules are 200 pages. Rich, I I'll, uh, honestly, the first eight pages is just a oh, bunch of muckety-muck, and then about 10 pages it's into uh, it, you get into really what it is. <clears throat> And then you'll get a lot of detail on exactly what they're talking about. I would strongly, strongly, strongly encourage right. that if you are applying for yes. these, you need to read those rules. Because they will actually give you verbiage on how you can even put your pieces together. This applies to everything, other than the documentary <laughs> stuff, which is what I'm talking today. The documentary stuff is a form you fill out. You're forced into the the fields that they tell you that they want you to fill out. So you need to just go fill them out. Sometimes it's not a form to fill out. Sometimes you need to bring a form to the government in part in your package. So for instance, um, there are a couple things here that are disclosures. And they require that somebody else is involved in your pulling that piece together. So for example, just like last time, you needed to have proof of fingerprinting. And they tell you where you'll do that, and they also tell you that don't you do that more than 30 days before you submit it. So you're allowed to start submitting it this on Valentine's Day. So if you're going to be one of the early submitter submissions, you can start to do your, your, your um, fingerprinting now. But I would recommend that you don't even think about fingerprinting until Valentine's Day. But on Valentine's Day, I would actually go do it because as you get closer to the time that you actually do submit all this, your life's going to get crazy. And it's going to get crazy because you're going to try to remember all the little last minute items and all this stuff that you could have gotten done behind you, where you go check, 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 I would highly recommend you get it done. You take care of it in, ad in advance of everything you can do. Other than fingerprinting because you can't do that now, you have to wait until closer to the time you submit. It has to be within 30 days. Same thing with, um, well, notarization, you can do at any time. You need to get a notary public, and the notary public needs to sign a statement for all of the people you're considering well, principal it, owners. And everybody who's a principal owner owns 1% or more of your company. They're written into your application. And so one group that I know of brought a notary public to a team meeting and have everyone do it at the same time was a lot cheaper to do it that way than for each individual person to go find a notary. You could also go to your bank. If you have a, a large commercial bank, they usually have a notary on staff. But those would be the ways that you can do that. But again, it's their form. You have to fill out a questionnaire with their information that they've got. And everybody's got to get the notary public. You have to sign it in front of the notary public. Sign it and date it. You can already have filled out the form before the notary sees is there. But the signing has to happen with notary there. OK. Um, I just sent you a text. We'll, we'll cover very quickly these three areas with the star here, because they are essentially new. They're new information on any previous the dispensary application. They did not exist. And what they are is proof of property ownership, mm -hmm. which is a big one, um, proof of zoning, and oh, you want to know. organizational you want to and financial disclosure. Oh, Proof of zoning, in a way, is the easiest because it doesn't require money. But on the other hand, you need to be in touch with your government officials. So for proof of zoning, you need to 
Which one? Connect with you, either your municipality or with your alderman if you're here in the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And you need to find out what you need to do to get a copy of the ordinance and ensure that the place that you intend to operate is covered from a zoning perspective in that place. That information needs to be signed off on and the form includes a place for the signature of that person. So you already need to be talking to these people. If you haven't already talked to the alderman or to the um, mayor or zoning person in your municipality, you'll need to do that and you'll need to get that. But that's dependent on that you've chosen a location. So let's talk about the location. In the last round of dispensary, you did not need to actually secure a location. In this case, you need to have a location secured. But what does that mean? It does not mean that you go out and buy a property. If you were going to buy a property, closing takes 30 days. You would not be able to sh demonstrate that the property you have would meet the requirements in enough time because it would you have to demonstrate that it's in your possession now if you already own a location then you need to make sure that the location you're in can be zoned or is zoned within the zone um, you may need to in the city of Chicago go for what they call special usage um, stipulation and so you'll need to work with your alderman on what that means because you might need to petition for special usage and then once you're you've gotten that, then you're be going to be able to demonstrate that you're covered under zoning there. But what does it mean to have principal ownership? Um, I, I mean, uh, property ownership. It does not necessarily mean that you own the place. It may very well mean that you just are, you can demonstrate that you're leasing a space. Now, leasing a space is also kind of take a gulp, take a deep breath, right? You're signing on the dotted line that you're paying a rent somewhere and then suddenly you owe money on a rent and you've got to demonstrate that you're in a, a, a lease agreement. Um, one of the things that I'm really happy to be able to share with you all is if that gives you pause. We have a couple of people <coughs> in Gromentum Lab, Mario's one of them, he's standing outside right now, but some other people who have gone ahead and taken on a financial obligation with regard to leasing space, large amounts, it's more space than they can do in a craft row or more space that they can do. And what they intend to do is ultimately put other businesses that are social equity businesses there. Um, if you need to show that you're in a lease agreement, what they've agreed to do is provide you the language and a lease agreement for a much small, like if you normally would have to pay, let's say $3,000 for your lease every month, starting February to demonstrate that in March you ha had property under control. Instead of that, working with someone like Mario or someone else like Diane, who's an advisor of ours, or some other people who've already gone and done this, you can instead pay in like much less. I don't know exactly what they're going to come up with, but let's say $300 or $500 a month until that time. And so it really defrays the cost for you if this was something that was giving you a hard time. The understanding will be that when in July 1st you find out, yes, you got it, you can, you'll renegotiate. If you want to be there, great. If you don't want to be there, you'll have to renegotiate. You'll have to find a, a different space and leave the, and then you'll have to inform the government that you're in a different space, and you'll have to go back and redo those sections, yet, you will have received your licensing and you will have your conditional licensing and you'll be able to have 180 days to, to change your spot if you want. If you do want to renegotiate and still be in those spaces, that's great. You'll have a different lease. But this way, we're pooling together resources to make it more affordable for people. So I just want to recognize that there are some great people who want to help you all do this so that you know it will be a temporary different space that you'd be signing, that your business is located, but it will help you in the meanwhile. Now, I saw a question there. Uh, do you expect, um, you know, considering the answers to the rules come out on the, the 21st, do you expect uh, anything to change with respect to the property acquisition come the 21st? Are, oh, right, you so mean because of the questions that came through? Okay. Right, so, you know, the, the state, yeah. you know, asked for questions to be submitted about the 15th, right? To, uh, so that was the first round. So. Mm -hmm. Generally, this, this round. right. So the well, no, there, there were two rounds of questions. So if you look here, thank you for actually saying this. 
Um, there were, there was already a round of questions that they, um, that they received. They were due on uh, January 15th, and I believe I wrote you all on January 14th. If you submitted questions by 5 o'clock on the 15th, those questions will be stated. The answers to those questions will be stated on January 28th. Second round, if there are more questions, they are also soliciting you to ask those questions by February 4th. And then the answers for those will come out, I don't know, a little bit later. Either way, and you'll get access to this, this presentation, you'll be able to go here to look at the answers to those questions. So I'm just explaining your question. Now I'll answer the, right. I'll answer. Do we expect anything to change? There will not be any changes. What those questions are always about are clarifications where their rules were not clear. Right. When it comes to, they will not be setting a new standard in an FAQ document, <clears throat> never. They would just be clarifying things that weren't perfectly clear. So the fact that you need to have property in your control will not change. Anything that's not clear on what that means, there may be shades of gray that get sharper. Does that help you? I mean, it might not be what you want to hear. But yeah, there, there's just some confusion with the transport. In the law, it says if a property is proposed, whereas in the questionnaire, it makes it seem as if it's mandatory. You know, from my perspective, there seems to be a conflict. And I'm wondering if there's some advocacy. It's going to be, it's going to be, I would proceed as if it's required. Okay. Because if they come back and tell you, if you, go, if you proceed as if it's not required, then you're losing valuable time. As long as you don't actually sign a lease, then it's, it's, you're still going to have to go through those motions. There's almost no way around that. If they come off of that for social equity, we'll definitely make sure that we do a big announcement on that. But I would start looking. And arrangements like the one that I'm talking about will really, really help you out. Because between now and July, for you to have to put out for this purpose, you know, $2,000 total instead of $14,000 total would be a huge help, right? So it's what we're trying to arrange. Sure. So this property ownership uh, requirement, is that for all of the applications, even for transporting? Not for transporting. OK. But it is for the other two. The last thing is financial disclosure. So organization and financial disclosure. So you have to demonstrate that you've got $20,000 of liquid assets now before you apply. That We can't really help with that. That is something that. That is going to be, if that's a deterrent, hey Jason, if that's a deterrent for, from your applying, then it is. I, there's nothing really Gromentum Lab can help you with in that situation. However, you may be able to um, if it is, uh, connect with, if you've ever heard of Good Tree Capital, Siki Ballard, the gentleman from Good Tree Capital, who is doing some loan guarantees. Um, he's helping defray the cost of application so that for the application itself, the $2,500 that you have to pay, you may get a loan from him. You have to provide documentation. You have to decide if you're comfortable with the documentation you have to provide, but you can get a loan. And perhaps he would be able to dem help you demonstrate that kind of liquidity as well. I don't know. But it would be a place to start. Okay, the last thing and probably the most important, it, all these things are required. Like, they're all equally important. You have to have these things. In addition, so, so, so important is your principal owner. Principal owners, again, are anybody who have 1% or more ownership in the entity that you're forming. And I hope everybody's already formed the entity that they want to create because having an entity is step one and everything else revolves around it, and if you have a question about that, you can ask. There's one person in the room who really knows a lot about equity creation here, and no one's going to believe who it is. I'm looking right at her right now. This here uh, is Isabel Garcia, and she works at the Secretary of State office. And in fact, and she is the person who receives all the applications for when you want to go and create an entity, regardless of if it's an LLC or an S Corp or a B Corp or a, any a nonprofit, whatever. She actually is the person who you hand your application to. So 
you might ask her some questions about it at some point today. <laughs> uh, I, hope I, I hope that wasn't too bad that I put you on the spot like that. So. But I know you know a lot about it. Yes. Good question. Um, you know, uh, the question is, is if you should create a separate entity for the transportation company than you did for the infuse or transport or whatever you're doing. Um, I don't know. I think it, I think it, you know, I'm gonna look at Jason. Jason's a lawyer here. What do you think about that, Jason? I, I, I don't think it's really necessary because you're still all such a cannabis, so when you're forming your LLC corporation, you're just writing for any lawful purpose. Okay, the, the only thing you might do is you might go back to your original articles yeah. and expand the definition yeah. because you would want it to be covered. So if you were, the way you did it was really, really general, then no problem. If you were very specific and saying that the business that I'm starting is a dispensary, you probably do need to go back. Okay, so. Do you agree, Isabel? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Simple. Awesome. All right, and that's why you want to be general on these things so you don't get caught up later on having to do tons of documentation. Okay, and then um, this thing about principal ownership is a really big deal. Why? Because part of the, if you try to look at this as kind of a game, you might enjoy this process a little bit more. And it's gonna be very intense and it's gonna be really lots of hours and lots of communicating with your partners and your team. And so the more fun you can have, the better off you all are. So that would be my suggestion. But if you're gonna, if you're gonna be doing this, you gotta think about like, What's the code you're trying to crack? You're trying to get the state to trust you. You're trying to get the state to believe in you. You're trying to get the state to have their socks knocked off because you have an amazing, amazing application and it stands head and shoulders above everyone else's. So in doing that, you're gonna wanna say, well, who are the people on my team? And why are they on my team? And if my bestie is on my team, just because they're my bestie, but they don't actually bring something that fills out the picture on what's required, okay, but it doesn't really help your story. Your story has to have that you know cannabis, you know the properties, you know the product, you know the market, you know how to do this work. You really need to demonstrate your capability or your team's capability. You need to be able to demonstrate that you understand the environment of a highly regulated industry. And if you've never worked in a highly regulated industry, trust me, you don't. So someone on your team has to. And then you've got to highlight and spotlight the people who have managed people before, who have owned the business before, because those people are gonna be the people that you need to rely on and that you need to help you tell the story that you, you got this one. Just because your social equity does not mean you have it. It means you get 20%, but that doesn't mean you have it. Having it means you have the skill set, you have the capability, you're gonna be able to scale your business. Scaling your business means you're gonna be able to mass produce something or offer what you can to the largest number of people out there because there's only 40 craft grow. There's only 40 infused. The state wants to create jobs. So you have gotta be able to demonstrate that you're creating jobs, that you're making Illinois a better place to be, and you're all in on that message. So every person you're putting up there has to be able to demonstrate, like cheerleader, think cheerleader. How do they help bring your team over? Everybody on the football team has a role. Everybody on the field, let me put it this way, everyone on the field has a role, even if they're not one of the 12 people playing football. And if you have any more than 12 people on the field at the time, you're gonna get a penalty. So think about every single person that you're bringing and why you're bringing them and what they're doing there and then tell a story about them and that's your principal owner form. And make sure you do it in the right amount of time. And it's so important because everything else in your entire application is all about your people. And this is it. Does anyone have any questions about this? I cannot. OK. I have a question. Yep. Um, is there any, um, I don't know, do you guys have the pulse on um, how the larger um, cultivators will handle the transport? Um, you know, are those conversations taking place? Um, are we looking at a third party kind of dominant market, or are we going to allow cultivators to really corner transport? 
Well, there are, it's an unlimited number of transport license, so I'm not sure. So you, I'm not sure I understood the question. What? Yeah, I'm just trying to see whether or not you guys are engaging the cultivators at all around social equity and transport. I just want to make sure that that's at the forefront and everyone is really thinking about So you're saying the, original, the existing company? Yeah, the existing cultivators. And whether or not they're planning on utilizing the social yeah, equity team into the transport model. They, um, first of all, many of them already have transport. Um, and taking care of, like within their operations already. But um, they're currently licensed, so they must come into compliance with the social equity. They payments. will have to come into compliance with it, but they don't. They don't have to come into compliance. They don't. There is no stipulation in any of the law that they. There's a quota on how many companies they employ that are social equity, or that they even do at all. So I just want to make sure we understand that there's a potential gap in the social equity fees. Piece related to transport, so I want everyone to be aware of that. Can you repeat but, that answer yeah. again? There's no. Well, I don't know what you mean by gap exactly. I mean, we, we, we're not, there are a lot of gaps, yeah, but I'm, yeah, but, I'm but trying social, to. Social equity doesn't seem to be at the forefront of transport, and, and as an advocacy group, I hope we are aware of that. So I would, I, I look at it actually differently than that. I look at it as social equity is at the forefront, Is it's the most at the forefront of of the whole entire legislation. And the reason I say that is because they created it so that the requirements to get into it were easier to access by people who would be considered social equity. Now having said that, you want to be able to know that you have a contract. You want, you want to be able to transport goods. So you've got to connect with companies that are producing goods, right? So one of the reasons that a group like this is a great group is that you'll you're meeting people and you're you're getting an opportunity to meet people who later on you can fulfill their contracts with for the large scale companies i can't necessarily influence their decision making on who they hire but they are you know they're going to do what they do in some cases they will hire because they'll want to demonstrate that they're doing this and one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to bring them into forums together to start developing their social equity plans. So some of them have gone on uh, public with their social equity plans and their incubate plans to incubate and stuff like that. But part of their plans, to your point, could consider um, bringing online or hiring transport companies that are social equity. I just think, though, also that it'll be very hard for any of them to do any concrete planning until we know who wins licenses and they're able to actually make those relationships. So it's sort of a catch-22 in a way until that time. Um, I, I don't necessarily think it's a gap, but it may be a gap. It may result in a gap. So I think that we need to stand by. And in the meanwhile, like you're saying, advocate and continue to push the, the issue. So thank you. Um, sorry, I didn't hear you quite well when you answered one of his questions. Uh, I'm just becoming aware that a transportation license have to be attached uh, to a cultivation license no. or? No. Uh, um, let's put it this way. You can, if you are a cultivator, you can get a transportation license. There are certain stipulations. I'll just forward to it right now. OK. There are certain stipulations about what requires that you have, you hire a transportation company. And so, so you, while well, you're saying that there's a gap, it's very, very, very unclear that there's definitely a gap. There may be, but here's the deal. And by the way, you can get all of these slides online. We're going to have them. I mean, you can take pictures of them all you want, but then I'm in them. You might want a cleaner slide <laughs> without me in it. But anyway. Um, um, or my team that's coming here today. So mm -hmm. here's, here's the deal. If, if, the popul if, if the location that you're in has more than 3 million people and you are, and you are um, in your source of whether you're getting your product from an infuser or you're getting your product from a craft grow is 2,000 feet, then you don't need a transportation <coughs> company. You, so there are some, some conditions where you will not need, law states there are conditions that you do not need to hire a transportation company in these situations. So if you're a transportation company 
And you want to see what your market is, because you do need to think about this kind of stuff, right? Because you need to put your numbers together. Well, then you can find out where all the dispensaries are that already exist, how far away they are from, if they're a, multi, if they're a vertically integrated company, how far away they are from where they're getting their product right now, how far away they are from whether that's flour or whether that's an infused product. And you can, you can say, OK, well, I can go to those companies because they meet these requirements. So some of them might be very much closely located to where they're producing. So it's going to vary. And that's part of the analysis you're able to do. I don't know if I'm hitting your question exactly, but I don't think it's, I mean, ultimately, one day, there will be too many transportation companies. But at the beginning, there may not be. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I think it's really crazy that there's no limit where there's limits with everything else. I mean, that to me sounds like it's going to be too many people doing transport. Um, any other questions on the documentary stuff? Can those same um, transporting companies transport for, let's say, an infusory company? So I don't want to have to deal with transporting. I would rather have a third party do it. for sure and deliver my product. They don't have to specialize in flour or infused. They can do both. There's nothing that says they have to do one or the other.